Roger, are you ready for a few fireball questions? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> if I've got a problem, I'll pass on to Robin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Roger, this one comes from Flavia in Argentina, who, if you don't know her, I recommend just typing in uh, Flavia X Argentina on YouTube. She has a fantastic TED talk about the beginning of Extinction Rebellion in Argentina. And she's asking about leadership in particular. And she says, well, isn't leadership, isn't, aren't the leaders of populist movements um, what we've been challenging in, in right-wing countries? How do we separate that kind of leadership from the leadership that we're looking to build? What's the difference fundamentally between a right-wing and a left-wing leadership? Well, the first thing to say and thanks very much, by the way, <laughs> for the question. Um, yeah, the first thing to say is we're practical revolutionaries. What practical means is we're not trying to create a perfect scenario. What we're trying to do is create a scenario that's better than another scenario. In other words, we're trying to create a leadership structure that is better than having no leadership. So no leadership is not a cost-free option. Having no leadership is chaotic, it's very difficult to get collective action to happen, and it's very difficult to inspire people. And there's every successful movement in the world, historically, has had some sort of leadership, whether it's informal or formal. So the first thing is to accept that we do need some form of leadership, and some form of leadership will come anyway. So it's better to make a good design for it than not to do it. So a good design for leadership is very difficult. <laughs> uh, I, I'm the first to say that, but that doesn't mean we can't have a good shot at it. And we do have models of what good leadership looks like. And in a nutshell, good leadership looks like something that is based on service rather than power and is based re on responsibility rather than power. In other words, what I personally seek to do is to try and serve the movements that I'm connected with. And that's through my intellectual labor, it's through my networking abilities, it's through my ability to raise money as someone who's got, got a profile. In other words, like I'm not here just to get the power as an end in itself. I'm not here in order to go on some ego trip. I don't care about earning loads of money. I don't need to, you know, have people praising me or all that bollocks. And I think the models are broadly the people who have led social movements in the 20th century, who in different ways have fulfilled, fulfilled it. Not perfectly, obviously, because they're historical figures and they all have their downsides. But people like Larry Kramer have backed up, obviously Martin Luther King and Gandhi and union leaders uh, throughout the century have modelled this form of leadership. And it's very different at its best than the leadership of right-wing popularism, which, as we know, idealises the leader rather than seeing the leader as someone who's providing a path to collective, uh, collective empowerment. There's loads of, you know, nuts and bolts in all that. And in my episodes, I've done an episode in design and revolution on on those elements but i think i'm really impatient to be honest with the movements for not encouraging leadership in this sense like picking out people with charisma with talent and saying right you're going to be a public face of this movement so that you can bring more people in because you can go and get us money and this isn't a luxury we can't afford not to you know, not to uh, design for um, in the present moment because of the urgency. Thanks, Roger. Uh, I think this urgency and the overwhelming uh, sense of our times is weighing on some people. We have another question here from Kuka in Argentina, um, who's asking about how to get, how to mobilize, how to start this revolution um, when people are already so weighed down you know, particularly in Argentina, with inflation, with these high economic problems, how do they find the time? Um, how do we get people from that um, who are already struggling involved? 
Well, again, the first thing to say is it's extremely difficult, right? <laughs> and, you know, there's, I'm also obviously aware that these two last questions come from Argentina and there are their obvious variations in the context and culture of different countries around the world. Having said both of those things, it's also true that there are good rules of thumb that apply in most situations most of the time. And the good rule of thumb that applies in most situations most of the time is you have to focus on the positives. And this is what I'm saying about naivety and cynicism. You know, cynicism is extremely understandable. It's even justified because it's fucking difficult to do this work, right? <laughs> it's disappointment after disappointment. But this is why you have to have like a naive attitude, a positive attitude of saying, OK, so what is it about the social space in Argentina that provides opportunities? Where are the points of conflict? Where are the points where people are getting emotional? What are they getting emotional about? What sort of leadership and structures of mobilisation can we introduce with the resources we've got into those frontline areas where people are ready to take collective action? You know, that's one element. The other element is to design organizations that are sustainable through being based upon trust, respect, and service. In other words, there's no point rushing off, you know, to the front line unless you have a solid organizational culture. These are the two things to focus on. Like I was just saying in the last half hour, right? The main question for you is what are you going to do next Wednesday? There's probably two things. You need to be looking at your organization or looking at creating a new organization if the existing organization is too decrepit, as you might say, and saying, right, how are we going to design that? And the A22 model has been replicated, you know, 10, 12 times. It's good enough to go. And I suggest you use that model in order to start mobilizing. And then, as I said, it's a matter of thinking about the particular context of your country and where are those those areas? What are those issues? So in Just a Boil, we're looking at creating what you might call a populist left strategy of saying, right, what are the biggest issues in the UK? Food poverty, public transport, local government corruption. OK, let's look at those in, in particular areas. You know, which towns, uh, what time of the year? In Italy, for instance, they're looking at where have there been the big climate like catastrophes in Italy, where have hundreds, thousands of people lost their homes? What's happening with the corruption in those areas? Can they go and engage those populations and engage in some sort of direct action to highlight what's going on? In Australia, there's a guy called Andy, I don't know if he's on the call. You know, he's had assemblies of 100 plus people in areas that have been flooded three times in two years, something like that. They're really pissed off. They're, wait they're waiting to go to the prime minister's house and dump their, you know, their houses literally in front of his gates. This is the sort of thing to focus on. And the last thing is to then create this, this strategy uh, of growth. You've got your organization, you've got your flashpoints. How are you going to use those flashpoints in order to get people to move from the here and now to a strategy of revolutionary change? And these, these, there's no easy questions to answer these questions, right? People in Argentina have been thinking about them for 200 years. So are people in France, right? You can read your histories. It's all about negotiating these designs and trying to get them to work over and over again until, you know, Bernie Sanders put you, puts you on his Facebook page, you know, or some guilt-stricken millionaire drops you some money. So that's, that's the direction of travel. I apologise that my answers are obviously a little bit broad brush, brush because I can't speak, you know, I, people don't want to speak to me for an hour. But in Designing Revolution, obviously, that's where I've done 40, 50 hours of going through these things in some detail. Um, it seems like the main sort of revolutionary fervour is actually in the anti-vax movement. Well, I think it might be also sometimes in the farmers. Um and in Australia, like, they've got a bad name as being all Nazis, right? But a lot of them just Steiner school parents, alternative medicine practitioners, people who've got a deep distrust of, ph of the pharmaceutical industry capture of the state. And it seems to me you should be able to reach out to them. On the other hand, it seems to be unbelievably hard. Um, do you have any ideas? 
Um, well, we need to have a sophisticated analysis with all sorts of these big questions of strategy, right? Because it's usually six of one and a half dozen of the other in the sense that, let's say for the sake of argument, 25% to 50% of the people involved in anti-vax movement and in anti-lockdown movements aren't actually primarily interested in anti-vax or anti-lockdown. They're just really pissed off with not being listened to and not being felt like they're part of the political process and excluded because of the political elite's monopoly of the public space. And as we know, like there's been these big demonstrations, they never get any publicity because the liberal elite space basically locks them out. This is, you know, understandable on one level because it's objectively irrational what they're saying. But on a political level, it's extremely stupid because it's alienating people who will move towards fascistic solutions in the coming decade because they're not being listened to. In other words, you need to have like a psychological, I'm sure you'll agree with me, Jane, <laughs> a psychological theory of politics, right? People don't agree with something because of the logic of it. They agree with something because that proposition is proposed to them in the context of providing for their human needs, their desire for community, their desire to express themselves, their desire to connect with others. And this is what most fascists do, right? They're not particularly interested in fascism. They could vote for the Social Democrats like they used to do in, you know, in the 1920s in Germany. Well, the reason they're going over to fascism is because no one gives a fuck about them. And that's how they feel. And there's no point in going, oh, well, you can always vote and blah, blah, blah. That's how they feel. So the strategy has to be engaging with them so that they can enter into spaces where they can be listened to. And often they'll change within five, 10 minutes. I'm, I'm being sophisticated here. I'm not saying all of them. I'm saying that a, a significant minority, maybe even a majority. Uh, and then that raises the issue of how you institutionalize that process. And that's quite complicated because all the progressive movements and the left movements around the Western world are just holding their nose, which is a disastrous strategy. You know, we, what we have to do is start prototyping how you go into a farming community. And I said this to the Netherlands people last yesterday, was you have to go into the farming communities and say, hi, can I come to your farming club, you know, in the local village and listen to what you have to say about why you're so pissed off. And you do that, you shut up and you listen. And when you've listened, you summarize. And when you summarize, after that, you ask questions. And only after that do you investigate together with them where, where they think they're going to go with their grievance. And that at that point, you've gained like enough trust to, for them to investigate that actually it's not about the lockdown. It's about the fucking rich. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> because that's really what's going on is the massive social inequality in our societies. Now, I'm not saying for a minute that's easy and da, da, da. But there's no point doing this, you know, Jane, you know, hero Jane goes off to talk to farmers. We need to think about it institutionally as movements. So we say, you know, in Germany, we're going to say, OK, 20 people are going to work on this over the next six months. They're going to have a big national Zoom to recruit people. They're going to create templates about how they go to farming communities in Germany. They're going to go and fail miserably for the first three months. And then they're going to design something that works. And as soon as you've got farmers on your side or the lockdown people, you know, you get them to do the testimonies and then you get them to do the meetings. So people are going, oh, that's someone like me saying, actually, it's not about, you know, being forced to have less nitrogen. It's about getting subsidies so we can make the transition without losing our, our livelihoods. You know, so we're not having this imposed. This is something I'm super passionate about at the moment because we're going to fail structurally if we don't do this work and and people misinterpret me and they think oh roger's gone soft just wants to do assemblies you know now and do a dialogical work pure bollocks i'm like totally saying civil resistance is absolutely essential but if it doesn't go along with a structural reaching out to what you might call the middling groups right farmers small business people uh christians you know churches these are the these are the 
the groups in the no man's land, as it were, right, who go over to the radical right when, as we see in America, the progressive forces don't systematically engage with ordinary people, you know, sit in the universities and all this stuff. So it's a big warning, you know, what's what's happened in America. It will be going to Australia and Europe and da, da, da. Anyway, I'm really interested, obviously, in people that, that are, are working on this. Um, and I think it's really the role of the big movements to do it, you know, in Germany or France or the UK, or, you know, that have the resources to 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 do something like this. Um, yeah. So that's that's the direction of travel. I don't know if I quite answered your question, but I think I did. No, that's great. Thank you. Naomi, you had a great question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, hi. Uh thanks. It was just around um terminology and uh the you in your original speech at the beginning, you talked about fascism. Um you also used terms like pro-social um and the elites. And I wondered how you know how closely do those correspond with um you know the idea of capitalism socialism and the elites and the bourgeoisie and whether it's whether that whether they're synonymous or different and how how you see the revolution sitting in those kind of terms is it am i completely off, off, off you know are, are they similar or are they very different well again you know if you want an honest answer to me from me um it's a bit of both <laughs> you know i'm not a very good popularist in the sense that you go well it's just like this right most things you know strategy is a sophisticated process of bringing nuance out so you can maximize the return on on your resource allocation uh that's the name of the game so it's not saying oh yeah we're still in 1910 there's a ruling class, there's the bourgeoisie, there's the working class, we have a revolution, we overthrow the ruling class, everything will be cool. And at the same time, as everyone's obviously aware, is the fundamental dynamics of capitalism haven't changed. And it's it's completely obvious at this stage of the game that capitalism will produce human extinction in the next generation if it's allowed to continue, because it's literally eating up the basis upon which life depends. There's no question about that. So what we have to do, and this is why this whole thing is called revolution in the 21st century, is we have to learn from the revolutionary movements of the past, but not in a reductive sense of going, oh, we're just going to need to repeat what they did in 1917. Obviously not. You know, the most obvious thing is that revolutions now happen in a complex and highly developed society, and they can and should be nonviolent. And that's from an ethical point of view, but it's also from a pragmatic and observational point of view. In terms of how to use the class system as part of the revolutionary rhetoric, you know, I'm quite inspired by Podemos, who decided to drop the conventional Marxist terminology and use the term elites or the caste, I think they called it. So that it you, you're starting from a fresh analysis in terms in, in terms of the terminology that you use. And personally, I like the idea of the term the elites rather than the ruling class, because the ruling class is a bit of a 1923 feel about it, right? The elites, everyone's aware of the elites, you know, as the international corporate class, you know, the people that own the land, they own the capital. We know what we're talking about. And what we're about, obviously, is engaging in these four different processes, culture, assemblies, direct action, strikes, you know, to bring all these things together in order to create a political constitution that gives power to ordinary people. And this is the big advance on the sort of Marxist, you know, Leninist top-down approach, which is, yeah, it's easy to get power. That's the easy bit. The difficult bit is to democratise it. And if we don't democratise it, then, you know, arguably we're not getting very far. So the great, the great sort of 21st century innovation here is not democracy, it's deliberative democracy, which is fundamentally different, where ordinary people through sortition actually control the executive. And, you know, there's plenty of nuance and sophistication around those ideas and debates, but that's the general, that's the general direction of travel. And, you know, as someone who does frontline mobilizing, and I'm sure you know as well, you know me, there's no po point marching around the Isle of Man going, down with the ruling class right? it's just not gonna turn people on you know you want to be saying look what's going on in your life 
you know, come to an assembly and talk about what's going on in the Isle of Man. What's going on? Why is it going on? Well, it's because people have got too much money. People don't need to have all the sophisticated language. They just need to have a space where they can identify. They all agree with each other that they're being screwed by the rich and powerful. And then on the basis of that collective realisation, you can start taking collective action, providing pathways for it. So, you know, I, I have this phrase, Anglo-Saxon, you know, everything needs to be written in Anglo-Saxon. It can't be written in university language. No, not Marxist language, not, you know, the language of discourse, all these posh words. You know, I can I can talk that language because I've done a PhD research, right? I can impress everyone with all those fancy words, but they're just not going to work. Because what those words mean is, I know loads, you don't know anything, and I'm telling you what you're supposed to think. And people don't like that. You know, we need to be talking, you know, the language of the street. And that's what left popularism is all about, of course. Uh, and that's the pathway, in my humble opinion.